Thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak. And I apologize, I have to speak in English out of necessity. So, uh, and so, well, somebody remarked just after Michael's talk that, so my job was now to just wrap everything up instead of explain how it all hangs together. And so, somehow luckily I had decided from the beginning not to attempt to do this. And so instead, I want to give a talk which is maybe a little different again to some of the previous talks. Uh, there, there'll be some, the relation with history will just be my own um, naive view of history. So my view of history of mathematics is the heroic view where, where Galois is supposed to inspire us and we, take the, we sort of derive maximal inspiration from, from him and from the, the work that followed. And uh, at the same time, I want to try and illustrate in some detail with some concrete examples some of the concepts that have been discussed in a way that I hope will be useful to at least some people here. So certainly not to any of the experts, but maybe to some other people. So, so, so my own understanding, which has sort of developed as I was you know, thinking about this, this, uh, this meeting, is that the theory of Galois representations seems to begin with Galois himself. So, so Galois, Uh, considers a polynomial of prime degree, say P, and he says that, well, we let G be the Galois group of F. Uh, I, I should say this is irreducible. And then he says that uh, G is solvable, and hence the polynomial is solvable by radicals, if and only if we have an embedding of G into this group of matrices sitting inside GL2FP, where, well, this G this G acts on the P roots of F, so this G naturally sits inside uh, the symmetric group on P letters, but this, this group acts on FP via affine linear transformations. And this is also has P letters, and so in fact this group sits inside SP as well. And so this was Galois so-called Galois theorem. And uh, it produces an example of a Galois representation over a finite field. So well, something I, I didn't uh, know until quite recently was that, of course, the, many people he did know, was that Galois also studied another example of, or introduced another example of represent, Galois representations into GL2FP. So, so again, Galois, and now I'll use the modern language, says if we consider an elliptic curve, and I have an example in mind, so let me write down my example. So y squared, this is an example of an elliptic curve. So that's a cubic equation in x and y, and it has some, some graph in the xy plane. And because it's a cubic curve, we have a relation which is somewhat hard to draw. This is a somewhat realistic depiction of the graph, but it's rather flat, so it's a little hard to draw. But when we draw a line, a line will meet in three points. A straight line will meet this cubic in three points. Now this cubic has one distinguished point at infinity. So all the way up here, there's a point at infinity. And so there's a, but there's a ternary, a ternary relation on the points of this cubic, and there's a point at infinity. And so we can define a, an operation. An operation is a ternary relation. We have to begin with two things and produce another, but we can 
think of it as a, as a three things being related. And so the relation is that p plus q plus r equals zero. So the point at infinity will be the zero if and only if p, q, and r are collinear. So, so the points of this elliptic curve form a group. And so this has been explained in the uh, lecture of Husserl and in the lecture of Bost. Uh, of course, Galois and his contemporaries, at least in a modern view, is probably, for me, easiest to say they labored under the language of elliptic integrals, which made it harder for them to discuss this group law. But they could certainly understand it and discuss it. And what they found is that, of course, these points are, I've drawn a real curve, but as most people or everyone here knows, in fact, if you plot the complex points of this curve, you get a torus, which we can describe, for example, as C modulo a lattice. So in Boss notation, he wrote gamma. So this is a, a lattice in C. And then it's easy to see the, uh, the torsion points. So the T P torsion points in, in our elliptic curve well, as a group, this is just as a space and as a group, it's a product of two circles. And so the p-torsion points are, are just, uh, if you like, the z mod pz cross z mod pz, or if you want, a two-dimensional vector space over fp. But, but a typical thing that seems to happen in number theory is that rather simple objects get presented in rather interesting ways. So that if you try to, for example, with this curve, that's not so hard, but already minorly painful to compute by hand the two torsion points. If you try to compute the three torsion points, you suffer more. The four tor torsion points is as far as I was personally willing to go by hand. It's not so easy to actually find the equations. So, so the equations on this curve that describe the x's and y's that, that live in this set of order p squared, these are the equations of, of multiplication that Jacobi and Abel and Galois were trying to find that Bosch was discussing. As he said, they're these marvelous formulas. One could also say horrendous formulas. So it's, not so, so it's somehow not so easy to actually describe this rather simple group concretely in terms of these x and y. And So one, one reflection of that is that, uh, so we write EP Q bar for the, the points that are P torsion. So be, the, the X and the Y will be algebraic numbers. And because the equation had coefficients in the rational numbers, the Galois group acts. We're solving an equation over Q. We have irrational solutions, but they have their Galois symmetry. And so this is another source of maps of the Galois group of Q into GL2 of FP. So those are two ways in which <coughs> Galois introduced uh, representations of the Galois group of Q into GL2 of a finite field. And so, uh, so the title of my talk was Galois representations, and so uh, Gal and Galois deformations, or deformations of Galois representations. So what is the, what, what is the theory of deformations about? So prima facie, if we begin with some row bar from a homomorphism from GQ into GO2FP, what we mean by deforming this means lifting row bar to 
representations whose, where the entries of the matrix live modulo higher powers of P. Say modulo, instead of just being having matrices to find modulo P, try and find representation with matrices to find modulo P to the N, which when you reduce modulo P, recovers the original row bar. So that's what I mean by lifting row bar to a row N. And so we want to study these, these lists or these deformations. And one thing we observe is they form a space. What does this mean? Well, what does it mean to have a space? You have a space if you can say whether two points in the set are close or not. And if we have two, if we have, for example, two lifts of row bar, modulo p to the 39, we could agree they were somewhat close if they agreed modulo p to the 38. Maybe still reasonably close, but not quite as close if they agree modulo p to the 20. Prima facie, they have to agree modulo p because they both lift row bar. But we can, so we can talk about how congruent different lifts are, and hence our set of lifts is a space. And the kind of basic goal given row bar, understand the space of lifts. And then an important point that I'll have to come back to is perhaps with conditions. So we can put conditions on our, on our lifts. And I, the kind of conditions that we might want to put are related to the conditions that Michael described in the, near the end of his talk, ramification conditions. So, but, but to ex sort of explain why we would do that, I have to talk about the kind of true goal. The more kind of rarefied goal of, of the theory is to establish the conjectured relationship between Galois representations and automorphic representations. So that's, so, so this theory of deforming Galois representations was introduced by Barry Mazur. So the whole thing kind of introduced, introduced by Barry Mazur inspired by work of Hida, in part, which had its, uh, Hida's work had its origins in the theory of, of modular forms in the relation with Galois representations. And uh, Mazur introduced his theory as a way to try and understand what Hida was doing, but more generally, to see more deeply how we would understand the relations between automorphic forms and Galois representations. So that's sort of been the goal of the theory from the beginning, and it's the goal of the practic practitioners currently. So, Oh. Oh. So And so uh, when I when I speak about Gawa representations satisfying certain, or lifting satisfying certain conditions, I have conditions in mind, which are gonna be conditions, at, local conditions at various primes on the Gawa side, which is supposed to match in the sense of Michael's matching of rho P's and pi P's, that are supposed to match with conditions on the automorphic side. But I think what I would like to do is to try and illustrate a, explain a Galois deformation problem, an actual honest one, which will illustrate some conditions, some liftings, some conclusions, and it's gonna be in a very special case, but I think it's sort of indicative of how the general theory goes. So let me turn to a special 
Gala defamation problem. Or I should say very particular one. Well, in fact, let me sort of as a So the problem I want to describe will be GL2, but let me begin with a preliminary with GL1. So this is an example that's been mentioned many times already because we can't help but discuss it. It's Gauss's theory of cyclotomy. But let me describe it in a certain way. It's not exactly how Gauss described it, I think. So as, as I'll use the language that uh, Jean-Marc Fontaine introduced in his talk. So, here A will be, can be any commutative ring, and we have the following functor that we can apply to A. So mu p to the n of A, we define to be the elements of A who, which are p to the nth roots of one. And so that's a functorial construction in the ring A. And and we produce a group, of course, if this is a, a subgroup of the multiplicative units inside A. So we have functorially construct a group from A. And we construct the group by solving an equation in A. So that's called a group scheme. It's in fact a finite flat group scheme. So this is an example. Well, this, this symbol is mu p to the n, is a finite flat group scheme. So it's a group that depends functorially on A, constructed by solving equations. And if you have such an object, you can apply it to Q bar. We can apply it to the algebraic closure of Q. And on the one hand, it's a functor, so we get an action of the Galois group of Q. Or more concretely, we're solving equations with coefficients in Q, even in Z, with values in Q bar. So we have an action of the Galois group of Q. Of course, in this particular case, it's not a mystery what the values are. The p to the n of unity form a cyclic group of order p. So this is isomorphic to Z mod p to the n. And so this action gives us a representation, maybe I'll call chi sub n, because it's a character, into GL1 of z mod p to the n. And this is called the mod p to the n cyclotomic character. So we can look at the mod p cyclotomic character, the chi 1. And then all these chi n's are deformations of that chi 1. So this is an example of a collection of compatible lifts of a one-dimensional mod p Galois representation. And they have a property, which is that they are finite flat. They are constructed by solving a finite flat group scheme. So this finite flat is an example of a ramification condition. So we've seen various ramification conditions occur in the previous talks. We've seen unramified away from S, We've seen crystalline and Durham at S. So this is a very special, a very special condition. It's a special case of crystalline. And it has a, it's a very concrete thing. It just means we're solving some equations. And so, so with this warm-up done, now we can move to n equals 2. Let me keep that. We move to n equals 2. OK, so now I want to begin with a row bar, a, a two-dimensional row bar, and then I'll, I'll write down some row n's. And so well, a good place to start is, is uh, Galois theorem, because that gave us some two-dimensional row bars. So we just have to choose an f. We have to choose a solvable polynomial with prime degree. So let me choose a famous one. So I take f of x equals x squared plus 1. 
in Galois' context. And he produces for me a two-dimensional Galois representation. I have the Galois group of Q. Of course, we, the roots of this we know. They're plus or minus I. So we factor through the Galois group of Q adjoin I over Q, which is a fairly simple group. It has the identity. It has complex conjugation, which we'll embed into F2 star, F2, 1, 0. But F2 stars are fairly simple groups. So we can just <coughs> one. Which just, well, 1 goes to the identity, and C goes to the only non-identity matrix, which is 1, 1, 0, 1. And so that's an example of a two-dimensional Galois representation. And <clears throat> one thing I want to remark is that this two-dimensional Galois representation is, again, finite flat. So this is an equation we can also obtain by solving equations. Of course, we built it by solving an equation, but that equation doesn't realize the representation as being finite flat. If we think about how the Galois group acts on the roots of this equation, we get a permutation representation on a set of order two. I'm trying to make a linear representation on a vector space over F2 of dimension two. But so this row bar, nevertheless, it's finite flat, and I can just write down the functor for you. So let me write it down. So I'll call it g sub 1 in anticipation of having some g sub n's in a moment. So g sub 1 is going to, again, be a functor that takes a ring and produces a group. So I start with a ring. And I'm going to produce a group. And it has to have something to do with the square root of minus 1. And you'll see that it does. So. I take my ring and I adjoin a variable i so that i squared equals minus 1. And then I look for elements, so not just in a, but elements in a adjoin i, such that a0 plus a1i squared equals 1, and also such that a0 times a1 equals 0. And now, so these are square roots of unity but not inside A, but they're square roots of unity inside A adjoin I. So they're naturally a multiplicative group. And you can check that G1 of Q bar, well, this, this is a, for any A, this is a group of order two. It's, it's constructed so all the elements have order two. So when we plug in Q bar, we're going to get some F2 vector space, and in fact, uh, it's spanned by, you just check, it's spanned by minus 1 plus 0i and little i. So this little i is the actual square root of minus 1 inside q bar. And this capital I is a formal square root of minus 1 that we adjoin to q bar. So it's uh, yes, 0 plus i times i. So those two elements span g1 of q bar as an F2 vector space. And you compute how gawa acts, and it acts with the representation rho bar. And so that's, for example, what it means to realize this row bar as a finite flat representation. And having done that, we can deform it. So this is step. So to form it in a kind of obvious way, if we had the second use of unity, we could lift them to fourth and then eighth and sixteenth use of unity and so on. So we can play the same kind of a game here. So we define Gn of A to be, so I have a variable now Zn. So this is an element of A adjoins Zn. And I want to satisfy the equation that this element now, 
to the uh, two to the nth power equals one. I again ask that the the products of the distinct coefficients vanish, and here this is the n, the formal variable satisfying the relation. Instead of just adjoining a square root of minus one, we adjoin a, a two to the nth root of minus one. And so again, this is some very explicit group scheme that we can write down. So again, this is thought of as sitting inside this multiplicative group. So it attaches a, a group to every A. We get a group, the exponent is two to the n. And We can map these groups one to the other by squaring. So we, we square and we set Zn squared equals Zn minus one and Z1 of course will be capital I. And you'll see that you get, a map, you get maps of these groups. And so we've written some uh, group schemes that form a kind of a, a, a group scheme of exponent two and then exponent four and exponent eight which are compatible. And we can take the Q bar points and we get a family of representations. So if we set rho n to be g n of q bar, this is a two-dimensional representation of g q over now z mod 2 to the n. And These rho n lift rho bar compatibly. So, so one reason I'm writing down uh, these equations is just so in the uh, uh, maybe the first day, Howard Edwards in his talk commented that Galois theory was in principle constructible, constructive, but in practice one couldn't write down the equations. And this is certainly the feeling one has when one works with elliptic curves and the torsion and elliptic curves. So I think it's somehow, at least for me, psychologically useful to see some family of finite fact group schemes, some family of equations, which is written down, which you can just see by hand is, is there. It's not a complicated thing. It's as concrete as, more concrete than what Gawa is writing in the premier memoir, but it's somehow pointing at the same time to the general theory, to the theory of schemes, to the theory of deformations, to the theory of Galois representations. So, now, what, what can we say now about this family? So is this family of any, uh, is this family of any merit at all? Well, This family has a very prescribed ramification because it's finite flat over, as we say, these group schemes are, f are flat over Z, so this is over Z. So this is a finite flat group scheme over Z. And that's a very, very tight ramification. And it's furthermore, it's the only kind of prime that's getting into the action is a prime two, and that's a very small prime. So Michael explained in his talk on the automorphic side that if you restrict the ramification, you get a fi finiteness statements. And he said that such things are less obvious on the Galois side. But we should remember there are some finiteness statements on the Galois side that we know well. So we know Minkowski's theorem, which tells us that there are no unramified extensions of Q. We know the finiteness of class groups. And then by class field theory, we know finiteness of abelian extensions if we restrict the ramification. And so similarly, this, this set of group schemes kind of is witnessing a certain finiteness statement because it, the ramification is so tightly constrained. And so what one can show is that the rho n are the unique lifts of rho bar that are finite flat over Z. And so that's a typical example of a theorem in deformation theory. You start with a row bar that's perhaps of interest. 
You impose conditions that reflect ramification. You, have, you hopefully have an example of Gauss representations you'd like to understand, and then you try to identify your, you try to make your example exhaustive enough, so make your examples sufficiently exhaustive in relation to the conditions you imposed to see that all the examples you know, is there a draft from some? All the examples you know coincide with all the possible examples that nature knows. And so, so of course the difficulty is if, you're if you make your constraints too tight, I mean, you may get something, a nice statement, but perhaps not of so much interest. So, so I want to push this example a little further, make it a little more interesting by introducing an elliptic curve. So, well, at least for me, that's kind of interesting enough to have an elliptic curve, hopefully for some other of you as well. And so which elliptic curve do I want to bring into the picture? So I'll, I'll use that one. So let me just recall it. So we have x, y squared, plus x, y plus x is equal to x cubed minus x squared minus x minus 14. Now, ah, yes, thank you. Of course. So, so this is actually a, a, a rather interesting elliptic curve. It's not sort of the first elliptic curve in nature, but it's maybe the third. So, so, so Husserl and Burst both explained in their talks that the, uh, in the 1830s, people were studying these modular equations. And so this is the equation that relates all the elliptic curves with varying modulus and all the isogenous elliptic curves, so some prime p. So, so the kind of modern notation for the uh, kind of the modular equation for p isogenies. So something we can do that was harder for, for the ancients to do is we don't have to write an equation, we can just give the object a name. So our notation is x naught p. And when we write x naught p, so as both explained, you have a choice of variables, j and j prime, k and k prime, k to the one quarter and k prime to the one quarter. When we write x naught of p, we're not committed to any particular variables. In fact, we can choose them as we want. So I'm going to choose these x and y, and this is x naught 17. So that's the curve x naught 17. So it's describing the modular, it's describing the relation between elliptic integrals and then 17 times the elliptic integral. Although I couldn't tell you now how to compute x and y in terms of k and k prime. But one could in principle, even in practice with a little calculation. So, so it's a very uh, natural curve. In the, and so, as, uh, and so as I described at the beginning, its torsion gives rise to Galois representations. And now, what kind? Well, there'll be, to, to compute the torsion on this curve, we have to solve equations. We have to draw lines and figure out when we add something to itself so many times whether we get zero or not. So we have to solve equations, so we get a group scheme. And what kind of a group scheme do we get? Well, we almost get a finite flat group scheme, except it won't be finite flat over z. In fact, there's an a priori reason for this. So there's a theorem of Grothendieck, which says, I think it's due to Grothendieck, which says that if all the n torsion group schemes for an elliptic curve, for every n a finite flat over z, then the elliptic curve would have good deduction at every prime over z. But this elliptic curve doesn't have good deduction, as Kronecker already knew. At 17, at seven, so, so at most, at most primes, when you reduce it, it looks like a, a nice cubic curve. But at 17, it uh, has it has a node. So this curve has a node at 17. In fact, I can even tell you the point, so you can check. So this has a node at the point 713 mod 17. You can just compute the derivatives there, and you'll see they both, both derivatives vanish. And so 
what happens is if you take torsion points, if you write down the group scheme of torsion points, it will be finite flat away from 17. But typically what happens, so you'll see this first when you look at the four division points, is that when you reduce the modulo 17, some of the points hit this node when you reduce the mod 17. And that means they escape from the group. So this nodal curve is not a group. The node is, the, if you remove the node, it's a group. At the, at the node, there's no group law. And so some of the torsion points escape into the node when you reduce mod 17. So, so it's a, a group scheme over Z, but it's finite flat just away from 17. What happens, what happens is that at the prime 17, when you look at, say, the, the, the 2 to the n torsion, and you have z mod 2 to the n cos z mod 2 to the n, and you reduce the mod 17, it will turn out that exactly one of the two dimensions doesn't go to the node, and everything else does. So kind of, so to speak, ha only half of the dimension of the Galois representation sort of survives in characteristic 17. So we say that's semi-stable. So this group scheme, so this Galois representation on the torsion points here, they are finite flat away from 17 and semi-stable at 17. And now, but not, that's not completely the case because there's a little mercy, which is that if you look at just the two torsion points, you can compute them. There's the origin, 11 over 4 and minus 15 over 8. There's minus 1, minus 2i, i. And then there's minus 1 plus 2i, minus i. These two have to be conjug conjugate. And so the two torsions defined over q adjoint i. So the Galois action on the two torsion is not trivial, but it factors through the, the Galois group, which is the same Galois group that rho bar factors through. And in fact, you can check this is isomorphic to rho bar. So this elliptic curve, the, uh, the two torsion doesn't know about this node in characteristic 17. The two torsion is finite float over z. But as you look at, if you were to compute the four and the eight and higher two power torsion, eventually it discovers the node. And so, uh, what do we have? Oh. So, We could look at, we can consider deformations of rho bar that are finite flat over z, the 17 inverted, and semi stable at 17, and The determinant equals the cyclotomic character. Because remember, as, uh, as Boss explained, for an elliptic curve, the determinant of the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the intersection pairing on homology become, gives you a pairing on the 2 to the n torsion, but it takes values in roots of unity. And so the determinant is a cyclotomic character. So we could look at that deformation problem. And then we have two solutions. So, so the row n coming from my group scheme is gn are one solution to this deformation problem. Because they're even finite, even at 17. They're better than semi-stable. And then I take the two to the m torsion points on this elliptic curve, and those are another solution. And uh, again, it turns out that these are the the unique 
or the only two solutions to that defamation problem. And so that's just another example of a defamation problem and a solution, but it's already a little more interesting because it involves an elliptic curve. It involves the characterization of an elliptic curve purely in defamation theoretic terms. And so, and so that's, that's one of the, uh, so this is sort of one of the goals in general of defamation theory, to characterize certain defamations of interest, perhaps especially attached to interesting objects such as elliptic curves, in some Gawa theoretic, purely Gawa theoretic terms. And how does this relate to automorphic forms? Well, so now let me just be a little briefer. But this elliptic curve E, it was, I mean, it was X naught 17. So it somehow tautologically relates to a modular form, actually. So it relates to a cusp form, which, well, I can write down the Q expansion. If anyone cares, it's, it's a certain form of level 17. And what about these, uh, these finite flat row n? Well, they relate to something as well. They, there's, an, there's another modular form of level 17, the Eisenstein series. There's this Q expansion. And you can check that for example, minus one and one are congruent mod two, and minus one and three are congruent mod two. These are congruent mod two. In fact, even if you forget the constant term, they're congruent mod four. And that reflects the fact that this row n and this e were deforming the same row bar. So, so the fact that you had two different families of Gau two different kind of solutions to the Gower deformation problem coming from the same row bar, on the automorphic side, that reflects that two automorphic forms were congruent. And so the theory of, uh, the theory of congruences of automorphic forms is sort of a tool on the automorphic side, which is the kind of automorphic mirror of the theory of Gower deformations. So we know there must, has to be, in the postmodern formulation, each side has to kind of answer a question, or maybe pose a question to the other side. And so, so the, theory, the question that the theory of Gower deformations poses to automorphic forms is the theory of congruences of automorphic forms. So, uh, okay, so that's sort of a, supposed to be an illustrative example that shows just some of the kind of technical features of the theory, but I hope gives some sense that it's the same mathematics, the same part of mathematics that was being studied by Ga Gawar and Abel and Jacobi. It's the same Kronecker. Gauss. It's in the same tradition. It's the same kind of questions. We've hopefully just moved a little further in our understanding. And what I'd like to uh, close with in the last few minutes is just to say, using this as some kind of illustration, what, what happens in the general case in the theory of deformations? So, well, ultimately what happens is that some spectacular theorems have been proved. So the modularity conjecture for elliptic curves. The Sato by Wiles and Taylor Wiles. The Sato Tate conjecture for elliptic curves by uh, Clausel and Harrison, Shepard Baron and Taylor. The, uh, and then another important result, very important, is the Sayers conjecture solved by Kari and Ventibage, and well, so Kissin. Uh, and roughly, Okay, so those are, those are some theorems, but where do, how, does, how do Gower deformations enter? And so roughly to prove these sort of theorems, one needs four st steps, and so we can just briefly describe the four steps and see how they relate to these examples. So the first thing is you need to construct Gower representations attached to automorphic forms. So in this case, I had only two automorphic forms in the picture, one was an Eisenstein series, and these correspond to some characters on the Gawa side, the abelian class field theory. And we had a cusp form that was attached to an elliptic curve, and so that problem was solved. But in general, this, somehow this 
This is a problem of Shimura varieties. So general, the the uh, developments arising from considering Kronecker's Jogenschaum to misquote Langlands is, is this part of the story. Then one has to, having shown that they are Galois representations attached to automorphic forms, one is going to try and show that they fill out certain deformation spaces. So one has to show that there are enough such Galois representations, which now is a question of showing there are enough automorphic forms. So one has to somehow count automorphic forms and be able to produce automorphic forms. Then one has to be able to bound the size of the Galois deformation space from above. One's bounding it from below by exhibiting automorphic forms and hence exhibiting Galois representations. And one must find some other way to bound it from above. And with luck, the two bounds meet. And then one's proved that all Galois representations of a certain kind are attached to automorphic forms. And there, so, there, so one basic difficulty, which has sort of been elided here, is you don't know what Galois deformation space you have to consider a priori. Because the Galois deformation space depends on the row bar. And if, suppose I have a, an elliptic curve that I'd like to prove is modular, and I look at its p division points, and that's a row bar. And I'm going to look at the deformation space for that row bar. And I'm going to try and fill it up with automorphic points. Well, I have to know there are some, any automorphic points at all. And the conjecture that they are such points was, was Serre's conjecture. And that's been proved. But the, the exhibiting for, for a fixed row bar to be, say, especially a dimension greater than 2, to exhibit any automorphic forms at all that give rise to this row bar, that live in its deformation space, seems to be one of the hardest problems. And maybe it's one of the, the roadblocks to further progress at the moment. So the generalization of Serre's conjecture is a, a fundamental issue. Once that's dealt with, there's a the question of exhibiting enough automorphic forms to fill out the deformation space. And that has to be coupled. So that's, and then there's a the problem of bounding the deformation space. So that, it turns out those two problems become coupled in an amazing method of Taylor and Wiles. And so the substance of the method roughly is that you have a very, very complicated space. And you can compute its tangent space. You can compute the tangent space to your deformation space at row bar, but it will turn out to be very high dimensional typically. And when that happens, you don't know whether it's high dimensional because the space is high dimensional or that's because the space is highly singular. And in fact, what you want is the space to be low dimensional. You want it to be as low as possible so you can fill it up with all the automorphic forms you know. But your, so your hope is that it's highly singular and low dimensional, but your fear is that it's quite smooth, but you know, huge dimensional. But so what, what happens in the theory of Taylor and Wiles is that they choose carefully certain directions in which to relax the deformation problem. And so it's as if, it's as if you were in the following situation. It's as if you had, it's as if you had this variety. And you computed the tangent space at the origin and saw that it was two-dimensional. But you didn't know that the, whether the variety was a surface or a curve. I mean, it looks like it should be a curve, but perhaps it's a surface, you know, perhaps this is, you know, perhaps there's something strange happening. It would be probably better if I added more variables, but let me just keep it as it is. And so the, the argument of Taylor and Wiles is the following, that you, you eliminate this equation F1. You, you see what happens when you remove that equation. But you carefully chose that F1 among all the possible elements in the ideal so that the tangent space did not enlarge. So the tangent space is still two-dimensional, but now there's only one equation. So we must have a smooth surface. And then our original variety must have been obtained by imposing a non-trivial equation in a smooth surface. So our original variety must have been a curve. So that's the argument of Taylor and Wiles. But you have to choose this equation very carefully to not change the tangent space. And at the same time, they want to fill up with automorphic points. So at the same time, you, as you remove that equation, you, you get more space now. There are more points that solve the equation. They choose these primes so that they can make sure there are a lot of automorphic points there. And I'll just close by saying that I was struck by, again, something I saw in Bosch's talk today. That, well, in the end, in the taylor wiles method, you choose these, relaxing the conditions, the equations you choose are the equations 
that say finite flat at 17. So when I relax, you know, in my two deformation problems I did, I relaxed the condition at 17 from finite flat to semi-stable. This is the kind of thing they do. They relax the condition by allowing ramification at a prime. But it's very interesting that you sort of have x naught 1, you have x naught q, this modular equation, and then as both said, you have x1 q, which looks at the, the actual q torsion points on the elliptic curve. And we saw in the letter of uh, Jacobi that this is unsolvable, but this is abelian. And this abelian extension is what makes it, the taylor wiles method work. And in the end, they can argue they're doing non-abelian class field theory, but in the end, they can use the principles of abelian class field theory as they're captured in the theory of Galois cohomology. And so, I mean, somehow, I found that a very kind of inspiring thing to see that the most advanced method in the current technique is somehow echoed being, you know, discussed in some sense, maybe in a very ephemeral sense, but appearing in some way back at the first practitioners of the theory of equations. It gives me a good sense of continuity in the field, and, you know, optimism for the future. So I'll stop there. Question? Anglais, préférence. The, the case you discussed at the end, it's complicated enough, but it's still the case where finally you prove that you have the isomorphism and you have a complete intersection, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So it's even more complicated. In the general case, and in particular in the well, well, in the most, I would say like the sort of there's a there's a more recent form of the Taylor Wiles method, which one will call, call the Taylor Wiles Kissing method, which deals with an additional phenomena, which is that when you when you relax the conditions at a prime to add automorphic forms, you, you count how many automorphic forms are added, and the number of automorphic forms you new forms you obtain is linear in the level. And that's enough to see that the dimension of the automorphic, if you close up the automorphic forms, the dimension of the space that they fill out is the right dimension. But these spaces could have multiple irreducible components. And so then one has to investigate the question of whether all the components are filled out by automorphic forms. In fact, it's just a slightly naive rendition of what really happens. But at that point, the commutative algebra and the geometry become more sophisticated. The complete intersection drops away a little bit. But still this... I think this is a kind of reasonable mental model for, for what's happening in the Taylor Wiles method. So I have a non-mathematical question. So if I understood <clears throat> correctly, you explained that a major open problem was to describe more or less explicitly the, the re representations that lift the given one. And for me, this question has a Jugendram-like flavor. So is this a delusion or is there a... I don't think so. And in fact, so I, I mean, I maybe gave a, a slightly wrong impression that, I mean, not only has says conjecture been proved for n equals 2, but there's a potential says conjecture for a kind of higher dimensional Galois representations, which is of vital importance in the progress in Sato Tate and everything else, but also of vital importance in the proof of the full says con conjecture. So, and, but that's an argument that uses geometry to construct the, uh, the lifts. And so, I mean, if we can interpret Jugendcham to mean the interaction between Galois representations and geometry, I mean, it's exactly, seems to be that sort of a question. Question. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it depends on the dreamer. Je ne sais pas s'il y a des questions dans l'amphi d'Arbou. Même pas si. <rire> en attendant, je voudrais rappeler qu'il y, euh, y a un cocktail à 19h 
au 45 rue d'Ulm, à l'école normale supérieure, dans la salle historique de la bibliothèque de Lettres. Voilà, tous les participants. Thank you.